Father Chase Hilgenbrink, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. You have a great story and I am excited to dive into it. Awesome, man. I really appreciate the invitation. And, you know, I, I tell people all the time, especially when I'm when I'm able to share the story that you want to hear. And I, I remind them that um, it's really not my story. It's this is this is a story that, that God wrote in my life. If I would have written the story, it would have been much different. And in fact, that's that's when I like changed mm. authorship, man. Like it was like I was writing the story. And then I realized that, that there's another author and it was the author of my life. And, and, and so once we get to know him, things change. And so what you're about to hear or what you're going to ask, wherever you want to go with this, you're going to hear what God has done in my life. And, and that's the story that I want to tell. And that's the story that I want to inspire and others to tell about themselves, like be, have a greater awareness of what else is going on in your life and, and, and who is guiding it. Is it you? Is it somebody else? Is it God himself? Uh, what is life all about? And uh, that changes everything. So right off the bat, you're a high energy guy. You, <laughs> and, and you're young, aren't you? You're like, you're not even, you're not 40. Are you in your I'm not 40. Let's leave it at that, man. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm not 40. <laughs> well, you were exercising. You were working out this morning with some college kids. Is that right? Here in yeah, normal? Yeah, so no, actually, I just drove over from Champaign on Thursdays. I, so I try to make my rounds around the diocese. And really, my, my goal in, in being a vocation director for our diocese is, is to run around all of Central Illinois, which is what the, the, the Diocese of Peoria encompasses, basically from Danville, which you're almost in, in Indiana, and then you go all the way to the Mississippi River, like Macomb and Quad Cities. And, and so we're covering all of central Illinois and my job is is to really um, to build up the youth uh, to find young men especially but young men and women who need to know that they're called by God to do something special with their life and and really it's almost like to put it in secular terms it's almost like a talent scout or or, mm -hmm. or, or a talent recruiter like where are the good men and women who need to know that they're called to something more and, and to build them up and to inspire them. And so the energy comes from a conviction that this mission is worth it and 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 that my life is meant to be given to, to God in this way and, and to build up his church, build up his kingdom, just as he asked. And and so I do my best. And uh, But on Thursdays uh, during the school year, I run to uh, Champaign and I hit the, the Catholic high school there, St. Thomas More. Mm -hmm. And and then the evenings I go to, to the Newman Center on the campus of the University of Illinois, which was my last assignment. Today, I drive over to Bloomington. We're hanging out here today. And from here, I'll go to Central Catholic High School right here in town during the lunch hour, try to try to meet some of the kids over there. Um, have built up some rapport, some good relationships with them. And then tonight I'll have a 5 p.m. mass at ISU and I'll, I'll do that throughout the year. And then I'll hang out with, with, with a lot of students, but especially the men that are over there. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't mean to seem in any way braggadocious, but you came on the right podcast if you're trying to reach young men in the central Illinois area, because a lot of them listen to this podcast. So I love it. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm glad. And, 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 you know, we were talking before the show that not a lot of young men are listening to podcasts. So kudos to you if, if you're getting that crowd and, and they're excited about something in, in life and they're excited about what you're doing. So keep mm -hmm. up your work, man. Well, thank you very much. So there are a million different directions we could go right now. I want to just dive into the heart of the story for sure, but I will keep some structure to this and start in kind of chronological order. And note that your story, your incredible story, that is not really your story, as you said, right. it kind of begins, correct me if I'm wrong, in Fairbury, Illinois, where I was born and raised. My brothers, <laughs> Mike and Brian, mind say they have memories of you and your brother, Blaze, skunking them in backyard <laughs> soccer. So is that true? And what was your upbringing in Fairbury, Illinois like, if you can remember? Sure. And and I have to give a shout out to Quincy, Illinois, too. It's just where I, my, my parents are actually from. And so we were, um, we were at a point of transition in our lives at that time. My, my, my parents had decided to move from Quincy for various reasons. And uh, uh, one of those those transition points was was Fairbury for us. And um, yeah, I was Prairie Central Hawk, man. I, I, that was my first love for a high school or for a mascot, um, was seeing that baby blue hawk. And I still have a, a little bit of love, even though after going to UHI, you know, being in the same conference, we, we tried to beat each other up. But um, yeah, there was something special about about being in Fairbury, and that was the first time that I started sports. So if you want to talk about like hey. where where that began, the Boys and Girls Club in Fairbury was where it was at, <laughs> you know. And so my brother That's and I awesome. plays. Yeah, we 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 certainly played. Uh, I'm sorry to say, or maybe it's a good thing for your brothers. I don't remember playing against them, but uh, or, or much of that experience. It, again, I was probably five six years old at that time, and mm -hmm. and just getting a start in sports. But that was a transition period for us. We we spent about three years in Fairbury, and then uh, moved here to Bloomington. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my brother Mike said his only memory, because he was pretty young too, was you and Blaze trying to teach him how to run faster. He said he never got it. So that's, you know, he, that's kind of where his soccer career started and ended. But 
So your soccer career really took off, it seems, when you started your kind of junior high, but more so high school career in U High, right here at U High High School. University High School in Normal, Illinois. You were inducted into their Hall of Fame, not necessarily for sports, but for a number of things, yeah. in 2014. And you were, a lot of us like to think that we we're good athletes in high school if we qualified for state or something like that. But you were on a completely different level. And I don't mean to, I know I know a lot of times priests are like, you know, shy about, you know, saying how great they were, and as humble people should be. But you were elite to say the least, you were on the U seventeen U seventeen national team for soccer, and that's a you know a yeah. national thing. You're on the Adidas All Star team. I mean, the list goes on. If I tried to list all your accolades, it'd be annoying to the listeners. So, yeah. is that fair to say? Is that when you started taking the sport seriously? Certainly. Um, you know, just like any young kid in America wants to play every sport and wants to play it well, and 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 perceives that that perhaps that's where their happiness lies. That's where greatness is. And I was I was a kid just like that. Uh, you know, I, it just so happened my parents were both athletes, and so I, I had a this, this, this conviction, and, and I had these good genes, right? And whenever mm-hmm. Blaze and I stepped on a field or stepped on a court, we just ended up being good at it, and it was just a, a great blessing, you know, that that something that we loved, we were good at, and maybe those things go together, right? When, when you're good at something, you you start to love it. Um, I certainly recognize that. In, in junior high, um, I, I, I try to laud all the time at Holy Trinity Junior High, uh, we won in, in seventh grade uh, a state championship. And that, that uh, in basketball, and that, mm-hmm. that ignited a thirst in me for greatness, a thirst in me in, in greatness in sport, even in seventh grade, you know, thinking like, what is possible? Like if we were, pos- if this, we were capable of doing something this great, and recognizing that was the first like sense of greatness that I that I got in my heart, and I was like, I want more of that. Whatever that is, I want more. And I was on this quest for for greatness, especially in sport. And so certainly moving on to high school, you know, when you're in, when you're in junior high, the only thing you want to do is wear a high school jersey. Those are the guys that you look up to, you know. And so um, I wanted to wear a high school jersey. And and when I got that opportunity to wear a high school jersey, then then yes, there was like I'm coming into to something new. I'm no longer a kid. What what could the, what could this possibly be? And, and at that time, Blaze and I both thought. What if this is an opportunity for us to pay for college, right? Mm-hmm. We, we didn't dream much beyond that. But it was when the accolades started to come out and, and we, you know, I had an, I had an opportunity to, to play for our, our United States under 17 national team. And when I made that team, I was, I was dumbfounded. I didn't know that I was that good, right? You don't know until somebody you tells you. You know? didn't know? Well, didn't you, you know, have like the praise of all your coaches and your peers and stuff? Because it seemed like that in my research, like everyone knew you were pretty darn good, but was that kind of the moment you Certainly, and you maybe knew? there's a lack of awareness of self, you know, in those ages of, of recognizing, yeah, like I'm, I'm good on every team that I play for, but on a national level, like how do I know that I'm that good on a national level? Right. Like, I don't know what the other kids in California, you think like, you know, California, New York, you, you think East Coast soccer, you think West Coast soccer, you think of these places and they're like, oh, they're probably better than me, I, I don't know. I don't know how I'd live up to, to that, but then you get into those games and you, you realize you can run with them. And um, and so when I was selected to the United States, United States seven, under 17 national team, that's when I realized, wait, maybe I am good enough to play beyond even college. Like that's when the dream began. That, that's, that's when high school is when the dream began. I was like, maybe, and then I was named, you know, uh, an All-American and and uh, and I was like, wow. And then the attention of, of colleges and then they start to fill your head with all the things that, that are possible for you and and how good you could be and and why you should attend their place and how they could they could project you in, in, into your future. So certainly there was, as back to your question, yes, that was the time where a certain awareness came about of this is this is getting real. And, and there, there couldn't have been more excitement that like, this is what I want for my life. So I, I'm making a bit of an assumption. I, I doubt that you were, and I know that you had a Catholic upbringing as well. So maybe that uh, made it so this wouldn't likely be a thing. You probably weren't, you don't strike me as a guy that would be that cocky, that full of himself in high school. Perhaps I'm wrong, but what kind of kid were you being the level of athlete that you were? Uh, if I understand correctly, you're also pretty sound academically. What what was your high school age like? What were you like at that time? Man, of all the interviews I've done in the last ten to fifteen years, I don't I don't know that I've ever been asked that question. So, um, you know, it, it's it's hard to describe yourself. You know, when you look back, I could be when I, when I look back at myself, I, I tend to be um, uh, more judgmental or a little bit more harsh because I'm not the man that I am today. And it's not that I'm really proud of the man that I am today, but I know, I know the man that I am today. 
and I have a conviction about what life is about and who I am. And, and, and if you remember back to high school, for any of us, probably it was the, that time we're starting to figure out who we are and what life is about. That's what every high school kid is asking. Like, why, why do we have identity crisis, right? We're like saying, like, who am I? What am I about? And, and what's life about? And so um, I, 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 don't, I didn't perceive myself as, as, as cocky in, in high school looking back. Um, at the same time, um, like you said, I, I knew I was pretty good. And, um, and, uh, I don't know what others would say about me at that time. I'm sure on the field, I carried myself as, as like knowing that I was better than you and I wanted to beat you. And, mm. and, and, and I probably made that known in some way, but I don't think the way that I carried myself, I don't, I, I hope that people wouldn't describe me as, as arrogant. Um, but I was also, you know, you talked about faith, you talked about, you know, friendship. Um, yeah, my, my family was, was, was devout, you know, that they wanted me to be a Christian. They wanted to be, uh, to be a firm Catholic. They wanted me to be a believer, a disciple of Jesus Christ, even though at those times, maybe we wouldn't have used that language and, and I wouldn't have known mm-hmm. what they were talking about. Um, but certainly my parents were very faithful and they were adamant that I would be faithful and my brother would be faithful. Um, and so, um, yeah, certainly went to, went to mass every weekend, every Sunday. Um, at that time I thought that's all, all Christianity was, you know, I, I just, you go to mass and you're good, you know, you're on a track to heaven. Like that's, that's what it's all about. Be a good person. Um, and then during the week, you know, I was probably just as, uh, just like any other kid, you know, um, I, 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 I wasn't, you know, trying to, to talk faith. I, I wasn't, you know, bragging about what kind of Christian I was or what kind of athlete I was. I don't know. I was hanging out with everybody else and, mm-hmm. and, and, um, doing all, all the things that anybody else did. So, um, yeah, I, I would say in, in that aspect, I was, I was, uh, I was just one of the guys in high school, you know, mm-hmm. We are brought to you by Fairberry Furniture. Fairberry Furniture is the area's favorite furniture store. Their selection is huge, their staff is helpful and friendly, and they have all of your favorite brands of mattresses, chairs, tables, recliners, couches, and basically all furniture items. Make your home comfy, stylish, and delightful when you shop at Fairberry's own beloved Fairberry Furniture. So were you, did you ever get caught up in that kind of you know, typical boy high school lifestyle, or were you too dedicated to your training? How hard were you training? Because you said you really didn't know where you stood on the national scene. Right. So does that mean that you weren't going to national tournaments and games and camps all over the place? You were mostly staying in Illinois. And and how much of how much free time did you yeah. have exactly? And then yeah. we'll move on to past high school. Sure, sure, sure. You know, um, yeah, so that, that was a strange time because... Um, my brother and I, when we realized that there was more to this and we needed to play on a higher level. Hmm. And so there was one team here in Bloomington and um, we realized that we needed to play on a higher level. And uh, we grew up here playing in, in travel soccer league in, in, in Bloomington and it was great. Um, shout out to the Hardy Stars, the the, the team that, that we had great success, and great still players. Around? No, <laughs> it was it was a one time show, and um, I'm sure it's morphed into to the clubs that we have here today. But um, so many of those guys ended up playing college soccer. You know, like we had a, we had an excellent team. But there came a time in high school when we realized we need we needed greater training, and I was told you know by national team coaches I need to be playing you know. Um, in Chicago, I need to be going to national tournaments and, and, and traveling a lot more. So Blaze and I started to, to travel to Chicago um, three times a week. So we were driving after school, uh, after school to Chicago three times a week to, to practice. And it, it was incredibly intense. Um, it wasn't a lot of fun. Um, that was probably the, my, my least fun that I had in soccer was during that time. It was just a grind. And um, my parents, I know, were really excited when we got our licenses because we got to drive ourselves and they didn't have to have to drive us every week. But um, so that that was a bit of a grind. But as far as on the national level, you know, when I started playing on the national team, that's that's when it became a lot of fun um, and 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 really enjoyed that process because um, they were demanding, you know, once a month flying to to San Diego to play at at the Olympic Training Center in in San Diego. And so I was getting to go out there. I was getting to go to Florida. I was getting to go a, a lot of places just to train once a month with that team. To be, to be prepared to travel around the world uh, to, to play different games in different tournaments. Wow. So the, the dream was alive and well, and you had a lot of confidence coming to the end of your high school career that you could become everything that you wanted to be in the, in the soccer world. Is that correct? 
Yeah, I, the opportunities were were all opening. They were all mm-hmm. opening, and I had a great awareness that that my life was was really being blessed by God. And I acknowledge that too. Um, even though, like I said, I, I wasn't I wasn't um, you know a, a super faithful kid in the sense that I, I was faithful to to the things I was meant to be faithful to, but I didn't necessarily have a prayer life. I didn't. I wasn't. You know, there was. I, I'll admittedly say that, that that soccer was a lot more important to me than my faith. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw greatness in in athletes and and not in priests or 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 in saints or anything like that so you know things have things have changed throughout time yeah saints and priests are a little less cool when you're in high school <laughs> much less cool and you gotta you gotta understand what what, what masculinity is my, my definition of Darn masculinity right. is is it was totally different back then you know mm-hmm. and there was there was nothing and that's why it, you know it was difficult for me to, to discern priesthood because in a sense this is not my definition of what a man is mm-hmm. you know and so I had to confront that and and and, and talk about you know, what is it that makes a real man? You know, our society talks about that all the time, but hmm. nobody seems to know what, what it is to be a real man. And that is a highly contested question for sure. Oh, it's yeah. it's so annoying because it's important in my very humble opinion. And I want to ask you the same question. What is, what does it mean to be a good man? But to me, that, I mean, that, that implies bravery. It implies courage. It implies overriding your carnal desires of of women and lust and things like that and doing instead the right thing a lot of being a good man in my opinion <laughs> is overriding these carnal pr- primitive desires yeah, but, but says who man says who says who says you yeah so, this well, is the problem say? like no 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you a hard time and playing devil's advocate because that's exactly what the culture is going to say to you, man. Like, says who? Like, who says we have to override carnal desires? Who says that that, that we should be virtuous? And what does it mean to be virtue? And who who defines virtue, man? Mm-hmm. Like, what are you talking about? You know. And so, until we get to that 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 same definition, we're, we're going to argue um, right. uh, about what it means to be a man. And that's why there's many different definitions because you and I um, both agree that that true manhood comes from the example of Jesus Christ, right? And so that that example of, of you know, no greater love has any man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Like that, that, that self-sacrificial love, which you're talking about, when we sacrifice ourselves for another, uh, and especially God, right? Laying down carnal desires, why? Who says that? Only, only God says that. Only Jesus Christ taught that that type of manhood. And so, um, why make yourself virtuous? Why, why seek after virtue? Um, why do that unless unless you know the man? And 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 that's 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 what it's all about. But yeah, I, I'm sure you and I have a very similar definition of 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 how to seek authentic masculinity, um, which will be uh, very much rejected in in our culture today. Mm-hmm. What's very interesting about that is that there is a large group of loud people who who preach that masculinity in most of its forms are toxic and that to be this traditional what they call traditional masculine man is actually terrible but oddly enough there are a lot of great women that are very attracted to the traditional yeah. form of masculinity. It's it's a very weird situation in society that I can't quite wrap my head around so Yeah. No, I don't. I don't, don't want to generalize. You know, uh, there are a lot of people who are allowed. You know, like to you know to, to to kind of play that polarized game that we have in our society today to, to talk about a certain group of people, and it's just you know, let's talk about truth. Like, like mm-hmm. what is it? What is it to be a man? And, and and can you back up your your definition of what that is, and 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 where that where that ends? Right. If we talk about you know living a virtuous life, where does a virtuous life end? Or or in living a non virtuous life, like where does that end? Where is that going? What is it? What is it all about, right? And so, um, yeah, we have to have honest conversations. We have to be open to those conversations, uh, but we have to speak truth. And mm. uh, and more and more, I'm I'm realizing that um, our our society, our culture, doesn't know truth, right? And 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 we don't believe in objective truth. So we're doing a lot of arguing right, without right. foundation, you know. And so I, I try not to get into those arguments. Um, I think that that more and more, um, we have to we have to give the example. We have to give the witness by the way of our life. You know, what, what way are you and I living to give the example of authentic masculinity, right? And, and, and so are we doing that? And, and I, look at, I look at my priest brothers and I say, are we doing that? And I look at men who are discerning priesthood and I say, are we doing that, right? If we're gonna say that this is the real authentic masculinity, like this is the way to live out manhood, to follow the person of Jesus Christ, to lay down your life for another, to be in, in service of another, not authoritative, right? But, but to live in service of another, to lay down your life for those who are in your care, right? The Pope is called the servant of the servant of all, 
right? That is the Pope's title, mm. to be the servant of the servant of all, right? Like he, he's, the higher you go in leadership, the more you are of a servant of those who are in your care. So the higher you go, the greater the servant that you're called to be, right? That's why, uh, you know, this, this authoritative um, image of, of, of masculinity or leadership or, or, or even using that word authority is a bad word, right? Mm. We shouldn't have authority, right? No. Um, all in its proper place, all in its proper order, as we would say as Christians. Like, like there's an order to our world. There's an order to nature. There's an mm -hmm. order uh, to, to, to humanity, right? And if we live that order, that's where the good women find good truth and men who are living that kind of order. Holy smokes, man, you fired me up. <laughs> I'm not joking when I say, holy cow. Okay, we got to move on with the story though, but thank you. That was brilliantly put. That is... Yes, you said it very well. And when you when you kind of go away from that order that we should all be striving for, you have the opposite of order, and that's chaos. And when stuff doesn't make sense, it's confusing. And then, I mean, the word Satan, I believe, means to scatter or something like that in, in mm -hmm. Greek. But and diablo, well, it comes from diabolos in, in the Greek. That's right. It means to divide. Right? Divide, right? Divide. That's right. Okay. So moving on from that, you leave high school. With a faith, you know, it's not an all-encompassing faith, you know, and you're really good at soccer. You go to a fantastic university, Division One, Clemson University. They're the Tigers, right? That's right. And you played on, you were a defender, if I understand correctly, with a Hall of Famer, like a really good other defender. You were right next to him. Oguchi, what was his name? Oguchi Anyewu. Yeah, he was like the last yeah. recipient of the U.S like soccer player of the year award that was a defender so that's a you were in good company and you're going to a fine university what was that process of going to college like and then what was college like sure you know well the process of going to college was was having all these uh options to to do different things and i saw my brother go um to to first like go through that process he's a year older than me so when I saw him kind of like discerning where he belonged and where he would fit in best, I learned a lot from him and, and my parents of, of discerning that decision. Um, and uh, he, he started out at, at, at Southwest Missouri State, which is now called Missouri State, eventually transferred to Butler, uh, which was an incredible move. The greatest is because he met his wife, my sister-in-law, Krista, there. Um, so in God's providence, um, they were put together in that place. They both were, were soccer players at Butler University together, uh, which is kind of a cool story and, and, um, and worth, worth telling as well. But I got to see that process and in, 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 in making friends on a national level, um, we recognized even at that at that time that we were all getting recruited by similar schools. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I had a dream of playing in the ACC, the Atlantic Coast Conference, right? That to me, that is that is the Mecca in the United States of, of college soccer. And I knew at all times, if I got recruited by an ACC school, if I had an opportunity to play there, that's, that's where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up getting re recruited by two schools there and I, I had to decide, but I, I talked to a bunch of those guys that I played on the national team with. One of them was mm -hmm. Oguchi Anyewu. And um, several of us decided to go to school together and mm. to try to make a powerhouse school and try to try to you know be be contenders on a national level. So several of us from that team, I'm I'm trying to think, maybe there was four or five of us from that team that that were freshmen at Clemson University together, um, and 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 transitioning into that time, it was a, it was an incredible experience. Um, every moment, uh, I can't think of, of of a bad experience at Clemson University. I love that school. I loved I loved being immersed in in, in a truly a sports culture that that's lived out there. Um, I had an incredible experience of of my soccer career, the goods and the bads. Um, uh, up and down, but but as a whole, uh, an amazing experience, and and playing on a, on a team that was constantly contending, you know, in the top ten in the country, and and uh, and and getting closer to to another dream, which was to move on from college soccer. We are brought to you by Marshalloni's Pizza in Fairbury, Illinois. Studies show that pizza from Marshalloni's Pizza in Fairbury is the tastiest pizza to those of us with properly functioning brains and taste buds. Don't fight the science. Pizza from Marshalloni's Pizza in Fairbury is spectacular. And not only that, but they also offer a daily happy hour. So if you call between 4 and 5 p.m. and order a pizza, you get the second one of equal or lesser value for free. Restrictions apply. You can even call at 4.45 p.m., order your pizzas, pick them up at 8 p.m., and you will still get the happy hour discount. For the most delicious pizzas around, head nowhere else but Marshalloni's Pizza in Fairbury, Illinois. 
Call them up and place your order today at 815-692-4602 and pick it up at 405 East Locust Street in Fairbury. What was life like, your college years life? Because, I mean, were you focused purely on soccer or were you was it girls, soccer, and school? Like, yeah, what, what occupied your mind during that time? Sure, you know, well, the first thing that occupied my mind, as I think, is that is it was one of the first weeks of living on my own. I remember mm-hmm. that. I remember that clearly. And, and and I often tell the youth this story, especially high schoolers as they're going off to college. I say, you know what I thought about the first week of 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 college? I thought I wanted all this independence. I finally wanted to be away from my parents. I wanted to make decisions on my own. I wanted to become my own man. I wanted to d- decide who I get to be in life. And I was I was cognizant that that was coming. And, and one of those things was I knew that my parents woke me up for mass every Sunday morning and that was something that I wasn't excited about. Mm-hmm. But in that first week of school, by God's grace, a question rolled across my head, which was, if I don't go to mass this Sunday, am I still a Christian? If I, if I don't continue practicing my faith, like when people ask me like, hey, who are you? Where are you from? Like, what are you about? Like, or we get deeper into conversation. Could I, could I actually say that I'm a Catholic? Or does that depend hmm. on ongoing relationship? It's like, it's like dating someone, right? Like, can I say that I'm dating this person if I don't talk to them anymore? <laughs> or if I don't go on dates anymore? Like, yeah. are we still dating? Like, I don't know. It's, we're in the middle somewhere, right? We got to define the relationship. So that happened to me that, that hmm. first week. I was like, wait a second. If I don't go to Mass Sunday, like, I, I've been looking forward to that. Am I still a Catholic? And all of a sudden, I realized that my identity as a Hilgenbrink was Christian, was Catholic. And, and I was thinking like, if I, I don't know that I want to be a Catholic right now. I, I don't know, but I know that I'm not capable of making that decision right now. Mm. Instead of being like incredibly virtuous and saying I remained a Catholic all, you know, all throughout my college years and, and throughout my entire life, uh, I wouldn't say that that was my virtue. It was actually, um, you know, maybe a weakness of saying, I don't want to throw something away because I don't, I don't yet know who I am. I don't yet know what I'm about. And so but I do know that to be a Hilgenbrink is to be a Catholic. Mm. And that, I give that back to my parents to say, like they formed me in a way to know who I was and what I was about. And, and slowly I started, I started to, to go to mass. And, and I, all of a sudden I, I started to listen because I was on my own because I made that decision on my own to be there. I actually felt like a man, right? Like I, I made a decision. That was my decision. And it was not what other people, people were doing, right? And so, um, and I got there and I, I started to realize that like, the priest actually had something to say. It was probably the first time I ever listened to a homily. It was probably the first time that I actually ever like listened to the prayers that I was saying. They were rolling out of my mouth and I was like, wait a second, if we actually believe this, this is amazing. Like, do I believe this? And I started asking those questions. <laughs> like, do I believe these things? Anyway, I continued to, to go to mass, um, but certainly um, my life was, was all about athletics. Um, anybody who goes to play, you know, a division one sport will probably attest to the fact um, that, your number one priority in college is that sport. It's told to you, um, even though coaches probably wouldn't say that publicly, like this is your number one priority. We actually work our academics around it, right? Mm-hmm. And academics are, 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 you know, also, you know, incredibly important, um, but they're certainly side by side and, and, um, and athletics often takes precedence over those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly I was, I was trying to fit my faith into, into all those things and, and to figure out what kind of manhood I was meant to live. I personally, when I went to college at Millican University and I was wrestling there, not nearly, nearly as cool. serious as, as your soccer career at Clemson, but I can remember that I, a lot of questions about God and my faith started to enter my mind. Sure. There even came a point where I'm like, nope, I don't, I don't think so. Right after that, I dove into like this research. My school suffered because of that. Yeah. But for a time, I was like, no way. I don't think there is a God. But the weirdest thing and it was purely habit because my parents used to wake me up to go to mass. No matter what, I yeah. was going to mass every Sunday and the holy day of obligation. Right. I kept going to mass by yeah. myself. And you're absolutely right. There's Your faith takes on a new life, I think, when you no longer are relying on your parents. It's no longer because of your parents that you're going to mass. When you go to mass by yourself, by your own right. choice, you said it perfectly. You feel like a man. It's like, okay, now I'm suddenly all ears. Like, I'm actually here now. In a certain sense, it's like the first time that you get to take your car out by yourself when you're 16. Right, you know, You've right. been driving with your parents for a year now and, and it's, it's totally lame. Um, and then all of a sudden you're like, 
yeah, I'm, I'm on my own right now. There's no one out here, you know? And so, yeah, there's a certain feeling of like, you know, I'm, I'm coming into a new phase of my life and, and a new understanding and, and there's something good about this and there's something natural about this, you know? And, 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 and throughout life, we have to continue to, to, to grow into that man or that woman that we're called to be. Nearly every kid that grows up Christian or specifically Catholic even, is going to be challenged in their faith when they go to college. That just seems to be the case, unless they go to Steubenville or whatever. So did that ever happen? be challenged there too. Yeah, probably. (laughs) Did that ever happen with you? Did your faith ever get kind of wishy-washy? I know you went to church. That's one thing. You went to Mass every Sunday. But what what was the deal with your faith? Did it go up and down? Did it go away? You know... um, Again, by God's grace, I know that the the Lord has had a, has a plan for all of us. But I was aware that He had a plan for my life. I didn't know that that was real. I didn't know what that was. I didn't know what it was about. Um, but I will say that uh, by God's grace, I I never doubted the existence of God. Um, and so it depends on. And I never doubted the 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 truth of of the Catholic Church. Like, uh, and that was challenged many times living in the Bible Belt. And when you have 10 people going to a Catholic mass in South Carolina, 2% of the population is Catholic, less than that on a college campus, and 10 people are going to mass over here, and you look across the street, and the Baptist church, you can't even get a parking spot. There's people just flowing Mm -hmm. out of that place. Like, you're gonna be challenged. And then playing with with teammates who are atheists and and challenge you on what you believe because they see you going to church. Like, there was all kinds of challenges. So I'm not saying, like, I I was in this bubble, right? Right. Um, But for whatever reason, I know a lot of people say, like really question whether God exists. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, certainly, in an intellectual level, I, I question that, like whether God exists. But in my heart, in my faith, like I don't, I don't believe my faith ever wavered, like that that God was real. Do you and, think that's and, because of what your parents taught you and your a proper upbringing and education, or, or or do you think it was just God's providence? You were blessed well, to have that. In certainly. Your heart? the way that God works entails both of those things always. Mm. God gives gifts, God, by God's grace, we can do nothing. By God's grace, we can do nothing. At the same time, he requires human participation in that grace. We often say in, in, in theology, grace builds on nature. So the more that we build our nature, the more you and I, getting back to our manhood talk, the more that you and I become virtuous, the more matter that God has to deal with Right, mm. he he can he can mold you more. Mm. The more Plato he has in his hands, like if we keep building, like the more things we can do. You go to the gym, like the more that you grow your muscles, the more that you're capable of, right? Yes, like, right. Like, the, the more, like I can help somebody carry boxes That's now. A great analogy. Right? So God has more to work with the more that we grow, right? Now, having said that, what is one of the main reasons? And this is this is really for your audience right now because this is something. This is one of my soapboxes about manhood. One of the main reasons that I never wavered in my belief is because of my father. My father is a real man. My father is is a real man. And I looked up to him, even when I wouldn't never tell him that, even when I was upset with him, even when, you know, I was I was a young punk kid that that um, betrayed him or or disobeyed him. Um, I knew that when my father said something, it was real. He was an honest man. He is an honest man. He's still alive. He's an honest man, right? He is a virtuous man. He's a man that does the right thing. I saw him do the right thing all the time. So when he tells me God exists and when I see him on his knees, recognizing that there, when you see your father and you think that he's a superhero when you're young, and then you see him on his knees and humbling himself before a God who he believes in, you know that God is real, right? Where is the fatherhood? Where is the manhood in our culture? Where are men getting on their knees in adoration and worship of God? That will change culture when men actually acknowledge there's a higher power and we don't use our authority as if we're almighty, but we bow to the almighty. So if you want the human factor, God's grace, certainly. But one of the greatest factors, even statistically, and I I look at statistics and I read books and I I read like how we can change culture and how we can, how we can, uh, you know, do the new evangelization and preach the gospel all over again. And what you read over and over, one of the main factors is the way that the father and a family lives out his faith. Mm-hmm. It's astounding. Yes, absolutely. Right? So I have no doubt the way that my dad lived out his faith was uh, one of the one of the critical factors. Now that's not to say that my mom didn't live that way as well. She's incredibly virtuous and, and a beautiful woman in her faith, um, and often carries you know the family by her prayers and her witness. But um, a young man looks up to his father. You darn right. And yeah. so, yeah, I, I do know that some of those factors were, were really important to me. And there were other there were other men in in, in our life. 
um, that, that were faithful. My parents, you know, even, you know, soccer players and, and their parents, um, you know, I think of, of some of those parents. Dr. Harold Nord uh, was, a, it was a, a man who just passed away a few years ago. He was one of the, the ones that I looked up to, you know, the most. He was he, um, just an incredibly faithful man. He did what was right. He told the truth with his life. He, he, he was an influential doctor here in town, and, and, and he never hid his faith. Like, I, I, was, just, I was just so, um, yeah, humbled by his witness, and I wish I, I had the opportunity to tell him that before he passed, um, now that I love my faith so much, you know. Mm-hmm. But other, uh, there's other men in our life that, that are affecting us, but um, certainly some of those factors helped me to become the man that I am today. Right, and you, you mentioned that a father is more so than anybody else probably, a role model to his son, an example to his son. And the thing is, that's for better or worse. So I feel like fathers Without- take responsibility for that and recognize the and hugely important role you have in developing your son's psyche, his character in every way, shape, and form, and his spiritual health as well. Right. That's an important job. And you as a spiritual father, that's an incredibly important job as well. I, My faith is not solely, but 90% is attributed to Father Archer in Fairbury. He, wow. That dude is so knowledgeable. He answered all my questions. I still call him up probably every month with a random question. He's a he smart ha- dude. Yes, yes, he is. He's a total nerd. I hope yeah. he don't mind me saying that, Father. He'll watch this, of course. But anyway, was there something else you wanted to say about that? I don't even remember what the question was, but if you want to get back to it, we certainly can. The question, <laughs> what was the question? I didn't write it down. So, gosh, oh, we were talking about college, is what it yeah. was. We were talking about college and your yeah, faith. Yeah, the influence of not shaking that faith in college and how that worked. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so um, getting back to that, I, yeah, I don't, I, I can't say that I ever doubted um, God's existence or whether I was going to be faithful. In fact, it was in college that I made that decision that, yeah, uh, I don't know, you know, my, my definition of faithfulness is different than it is today, too. Like, you got to understand that. Like, my definition of faith was, do I believe God exists? Yes, then I have faith, right? Um, mm. Am I faithful? Well, do I go to church on Sunday? Yeah, I'm faithful, right? So I'm a faithful Catholic, right? But I learned later that 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 faith goes much beyond that, and it's the way that I live my life, and that's something that that I struggled with because I was I was a teenager, I was a college student, I was I was a, a young adult living in a professional soccer world, all those things. It's it's always been difficult to live as a Christian in our society, right? It's always been difficult for that, um, and I fell into the same pitfalls as anybody else of 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 how to live that out. But it was finally. When I got to that place beyond college, and then I started asking more questions about who I am, the, the greatest philosophical questions of life, which everyone should ask, uh, but only if they're in a healthy mental state. I hear a lot of mm. high school and college kids asking this question that I asked, and I was in a good place to ask it, but that question of like, why am I even on earth, uh. right? I, I asked that question. When I moved to a new country, and I, know, I don't know if we're there yet in the story, but when I moved to another country, I was by myself, I was playing professional soccer, I'm sitting in this place and I'm, I'm, I'm like wondering like, why, why am I here? Like, like in, in this physically in this country, w- but, but more than that, like, what am I doing here? What am I doing in life? Like, what is life all about? Like, am I gonna play this sport for the rest of my life? What happens? This is one of my favorite talks that I give to athletes today is what happens when the jersey comes off? Mm-hmm. What happens? Like, who am I then? Because I've been hiding behind this, this jersey for since I was five years old in Fairbury, right? I've worn a jersey every, almost every day of my life since, since Fairbury, five years old, Boys and Girls Club, all the way until 25 years old, 26 years old, professional athlete. I've been wearing a jersey and that's who I am. The question is, who am I when the jersey comes off? That's scary. If you look mm-hmm. at athletes, and I won't get on my soapbox, but if you look at athletes across the board, Every athlete struggles when the jersey comes off, struggles with identity, struggles with what happens now. Who am I? When people don't know me without my jersey, then what do I do? And I see this, I, being in college, I see this with high school athletes that, that wanted to play college sports and it didn't work out. And, and now, they're like, I don't, know, I don't know who I am. I mean, I was always the best volleyball player in my high school. I was always the best you know, basketball player. In my high, I, I was this or I was that. I, I, I give my life to this sport. They gave me nothing back. Dude. Yeah, yeah, because you weren't made for sports, man. Right. Like, that's that's when it all comes out. So, um, yeah, a lot of those those philosophical questions of, and I started to ask myself, like, who am I? Who who is Chase Hilgenbrink? Like, who who are you? And um, and that that question has has grave consequences, right? About who we become. We are brought to you by Tri-County Carpet and Flooring, Sales and Installation in Fairbury, Illinois. 
Tri-County Carpet and Flooring in Fairbury is the premier flooring store throughout Livingston, McLean, and Ford counties. From choosing the perfect flooring to measuring an installation, Tri-County ensures top quality products and services. Their trained professionals boast precise measurements, straight cuts, and perfect fits, while their showroom houses a multitude of gorgeous, top quality, name brand carpet and flooring options in the latest styles and colors that are durable and long lasting. With free estimates, design consultation, and contractor and multi-room discounts, Tri-County in Fairbury is your one-stop shop for all of your home and business flooring needs. Pay them a visit at 19 Jan Lane in Fairbury, Illinois, right off of Route 24, and give them a call at 815-692-3666. Tri-County Carpet, your flooring paradise. What were you mulling over this philosophical question for a long time, a period of years, or did you have an answer? It was, it was, I wasn't mulling over it. It was just, I think it just naturally comes up. One thing that I never had in my life, um, prior to, to, um, moving to another country when I'm 22 years old, I realized that the one thing that I never had in my life was silence. Dude, I lived in I lived in a world of noise. We all live in a world of noise, and that was before the iPhone, man. Like, I, I was living in this world where I was always on a team. Um, thanks be to God, like friendship came pretty easily to me. I like I had friendship throughout my entire life. I had a group of friends. Um, there was never a time that I was alone in college. There was never. I mean, I lived with teammates. I, I I played on this team. I was surrounded by people who who knew me, loved me, whatever. That was that was life. Then I go to this country where I thought it was gonna be, you know, my hero is Michael Jordan. I thought I was gonna be like Michael Jordan of, of, of soccer, like winning championships, loved by everybody. My teammates mm -hmm. love me. You know, I'm going to these awesome parties. I'm driving a big car, living in a big house and got beautiful women surrounding me and all this kind of stuff. Like, it's gonna be awesome, right? It wasn't the reality. I, I moved to this country and, and I knew nothing. Um, people there didn't want me there. My teammates didn't want me there. I get to this team where people are like, this, this gringo thinks he can play soccer. He comes from a country that doesn't play soccer, right? Like, and you want to take one of our jobs? Like for us, this is our livelihood. For you, this is, this is your hobby. You, you have a college degree. Like, and so there's nobody with a college degree playing soccer, right? When you're 17, if you don't make it by the, by the time you're 18, you don't play soccer anymore, right? I was, I was enemy. Wow. Right? And so I didn't have teammates that loved me. I had people that looked at me skeptically. I had people who didn't want me there. Um, I didn't speak the language. That might be a little bit harsh, by the way. Again, looking back, that might be a little bit harsh characterization. There were people that accepted me, were interested in me, wanted to know what it was like in the United States of America, wanted to know why I had blue eyes, wanted to know, you know, all these things. But of course, that's of not what sticks out in your, it doesn't. In your memory. Right? You know, looking back, I just remember the, the, the struggle. I remember mm -hmm. the struggle of, of being in this place, of not having my family around who I love, not having uh, friends around who I live with, um, and, and just being in a place where, where it was like really difficult to start to live out my dream um, and, and, and to sign a contract and, 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 and to make my way and wondering, wondering if I could do it and arriving in three months of rain in the middle of a Mediterranean winter, you know, hmm. um, almost like a, a Portland type, type climate. So it, that's when all these questions like, like seriously, what am I doing here? Like, do I wanna be here? at all. Um, and then what is life all about? And um, that was all answered in the first six months. And just for our listeners to understand where we're at in the story. So after you graduate from Clemson University, uh, you had a fine career, you know, you had some uh, pretty good results with the team. I believe Clemson might have won the ACCs a couple times. Is that correct? Yeah, we won the ACC championship. Um, that was probably our, our greatest, our greatest victory there. Um, uh, went to the Elite Eight twice and right. yeah, finished in the top 10. So yeah, um, never got over that hump of winning a national championship, which was certainly the goal. Um, but um, yeah, you still wish success. you could have done that. Oh, it's, it's still, it's still, <laughs> it's, 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 hard. Like it it's hard to talk about. It stings, man. Wow. It stings. Yeah. Well, okay. So anyway, after your college career, you were on, what's the word? Not freelance. It's like you were a free agent basically yep. in the soccer draft and you ended up somehow going to play professional soccer in Chile, in their in what's the equivalent to like the NFL in the United States, correct? Only right. over there in their national league. That's right. 
and you played for, I forget who, but I'll let you explain. Yeah, so I, I was brought over t- by a team called Huachipato, which um, is a Division One team uh, in that country, well known, and and, um, and 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 they brought me in on trial. Like I didn't have any contract signed. I had, I really, I bought a one way ticket and, and and told my family like I'm going to make it. Like. It, this is going to happen. I'm, I'm going to do my best, but um, there are a lot of complications and details that maybe aren't, you know, important to how that actually happened, how contracts were signed, and how long it took, and and all that kind of stuff. But I had to prove myself. I'll say that I had to prove myself, and it was it, it took some time. Um, mm. But during that time was was when I was realizing for the first time, like um, life has changed, life's different. You know, adulting is different. You know, and. Um, and so I get to this place and, and, and I was taken in by a family. I lived with uh, one of the directors of the team. His family took me in and I, I lived with the family for, the, for those first six months. And I realized that really when it came down to it, I was, I was trying to synthesize my life and I realized that there was only two things in my life that hadn't changed when I traveled that far away, only two things. And the first one was the sport of soccer. I, soccer is a universal sport. It is the universal sport, you know? And so I felt so comfortable. I felt at home on the field. Mm. So. I, my, my job was to, to, to work for two hours a day. And when I say work for two hours a day, that's what practice is, right? Like you, you, you go to work and you, you practice for two hours a day. Well, because that was where I felt at home and, and, and even when I didn't understand the language, I knew when my coach, coach was cussing me out what he was talking about because I was supposed mm. to be somewhere else because I didn't do what I was supposed to do or whatever. When, when players were yelling at me, I didn't understand them, but I understood them, you know? Like I, I spoke that language. Well, real quick, what, what yeah. were your majors in college? Were so I Spanish? I, I, yeah, so I studied Spanish and international trade. And anybody okay. who tells you that by getting a Spanish degree <laughs> that you speak Spanish is wrong, right? Okay, like, I was gonna say, I was like, no. you had to understand a little. I did. It, it allowed me to learn the language like really fast. It allowed, okay. me, allowed me to learn the language really fast. But um, <laughs> when you learn from a book, hola, como esta usted? You know, like right. there's no one in the world that talks like that. No. You know, you get to Chile and with their accent, with their slang, like it's all slang, you know? Yeah, so th- they would say something like, hola, por como esta el weón? Like, like, Jeez, what is they're really slurring like, them together, right? Right, like, and, and, and there's a different accent. And even at that, I was lost, you know? Mm-hmm. And of course, on top of that, I joke with people because the, the, the Spanish that I learned was in a locker room, um, which is a bunch of uneducated athletes, you know, teaching you the worst of, of the language, you know? <laughs> and so that became the language that I spoke. And sometimes I didn't even know that it was, it was you know, I shouldn't speak it in certain circles. But um, so I get to this place and, and I, started, I started to show up an hour early for, for training. I started to stay an hour after. Um, a lot of people, again, thought I was like this virtuous, like great professional, you know? And they didn't realize that I was actually lonely. Like I didn't know what else to do. Like that was, that was, that was my livelihood. Mm-hmm. So soccer being that universal sport, the, the, the other thing that, that never changed was, was the Catholic church, right? You can go anywhere in the world and the Catholic Church is the same. Like I knew Jesus was there in the tabernacle. Like I, there, there was there was no question about that. Like I went into that church and I knew where Jesus was at. I knew where I was supposed to be. I knew, you know, during mass, I knew when to sit, when to kneel, when to ask for forgiveness, when when when, when to stand, when to, when to shake hands, when to do whatever. And I didn't understand a word, right? Like I understood amen, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's the same word everywhere. But um, I knew when to go forward to receive communion. I knew what I was doing, but I didn't understand a word. I was at home there. I couldn't explain it theologically, which I can do today, but at that time I felt at home. I felt more united to my family and to the United States more than ever when I was in mass, when I was in a Catholic church, right? And it's because it, it, it is the universal mass, like it doesn't change. I, I feel sorry sometimes for some of my other friends uh, who, who aren't Catholic, but really faithful Christians. And they, they go out of town, I'm like, are you going to you know, church today? You know? And, and some of them will be like, well, no, my church is back home. I'm like dang, like that that stinks. There's there's like you you don't have a place to go when you're on vacation. Like I can go to any Catholic church and like I'm I'm there in the mass. It's the it's the universal church. It is it is the place. I know I know I know where I'm supposed to be, where I'm at. Um, this is my family. This is my family, right? Um, and 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 not that 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 other Christians aren't, but I know my home. And you know? it's incredible. I mean, the the word Catholic means universal, and it right. truly was universal when, and it still is. But when every mass in the world was in Latin, boy, you could you could be in Chile and United States, Ireland, go to a Latin mass. It's exactly the same language. Yeah, awesome. That Isn't is that just cool? awesome. And then and then they also read the same sermon, like this part of the gospel. They're on the same the schedule. lectionary. Yeah, like the readings are the same throughout the world. Every every church, every place, anywhere you go. That yeah. is sweet, and that and that comes from an overseeing government body type of thing in, in the Vatican, largely. Right. I love it. That is unreal. And that I mean, I can't help but think that that is exactly how it should be. 
You know? That's great. The, the, the church everywhere is worshiping together. That, that, that's what's what the yeah. unity is about. It's, it's about yeah. we're reading the same scripture. We're, 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 we're praying the same words. Um, we're saying the same creed, the same Gloria. You know, we're, we're praying through all of these, these scriptural texts and, and brought about in, into worship. Mm-hmm. And um, it's the same place. It's the same no, no matter where, where you're at, whether you're in Bloomington, um, Denver, or, or Tokyo. Like this is this is you're doing. It's the same mass. Mm-hmm. It's so awesome. It's so and awesome. You're all united also in the body of Christ at communion. I think that's pretty darn even incredible more importantly, as well. right? Like it, when we form that, when we receive the Eucharist, we 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 become the mystical body of Christ. We form that body of Christ. Like that that is the body of Christ. We're we're not only united to one another. Mm-hmm. But we're united like heaven on earth, right? Like we're united to those who have who've passed beyond this life who form the body of Christ in heaven, right? right? So there's the body of Christ exists on earth, the body of Christ exists in heaven, and we're united through the body of Jesus, which is present in the most holy Eucharist. Right. So in this story, Chase, you're only 22 years old in a totally different country, speaking a different language. That's nuts. 22 is, is very, I, I was 22 last year. Like that's very <laughs> young. And I couldn't imagine myself being, especially in an age with no iPhones, ripped out of the United States in this very different kind of environment that's safe, full of friends, uh, great food, you know, on a college campus and just plucked out of there and dropped in Chile, which I imagine is a totally different environment. And th- so what happens between the age 22 and age 25? Because I understand there's a lot that goes on because when sure. you're 25, well, I'll let you just yeah, tell that. You know, so in those first six months, in those first six months where I was kind of reeling a little bit and, and wondering what life was all about and feeling that loneliness and, and, and trying to figure out what I was meant to do there. Um, that was when I started, you know, even after practice, I would start stopping by the, the church, you know, even when there was a mass, I would just stop by. Um, I didn't know how to pray. In that way, I mean, um, again, my parents taught me like wrote prayers, like you know, Our Father and Hail Mary and, and Rosary, and and you know, I could say the prayers at Mass, um, but I, you know, all my Protestant friends talked about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I didn't think that was a Catholic thing, you know. Like <laughs> it turns out, that, yes, we are all called the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I just didn't know how to do it, you know. Right. And so I, what I started doing is just spending time in the church, in the presence of Jesus, and speaking to Him from my heart. It turns out that that's what. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ is is actually speaking from our hearts as friends, like speaking to your Father, speaking speaking to the one that you love and the one who loves you, right? And it's, it's an exchange of heart. That's you know we say as heart speaks to heart. You know it's that it's that it's that it's that greatest intimacy. You know, uh, on the, that exists in the entire world is, is is the exchange of our hearts. You know, and so um, I started to do that, and I, I started to experience what we call like consolation. I was I was consoled there, and so I kept coming back. I kept coming back and speaking to the Lord. And it was in one of those times um, that, that I was speaking to the Lord and I was really asking like what my life is about and I was praying for comfort. I was like, Lord, I'm, I'm struggling, man. Like seriously, I'm struggling. Like I'm, I bring comfort into my life. Like mm. help me to, to become a starter. Help me to have a great girlfriend. Help me to go to great parties. Help me, all those things that I wanted. Great parties. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like come on, Lord, like bring it. Uh-huh. Um, I know you want good for me and I know these things are Throw good for me. Throw me a bone, yeah. And in that moment, there was a moment, there was a moment in which I heard the words deep into my heart. I heard those words that weren't, weren't audibly spoken. I heard, be my priest. I, and, and that shocked me. Like, I, I wasn't even thinking about priesthood. Why, why would that come into my mind at that moment when I was praying before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament? Like, why, why was that on my mind? Um, and, and at that moment, I was, I, I, was, I was terrified, but priesthood was nothing that I wanted to do with. I didn't want anything to do with priesthood. Um, and it was not my ideal of greatness. It wasn't my idea of manhood, as I told you. Um, you know, I was, I was supposed to have a lot of money. I was supposed to have great parties. I was supposed to have great women. I was supposed to, you know, have, have all of these things. Um, and priesthood didn't offer any of those things. Like, how could that possibly be the man that I'm called to be? Um, so even in that, I, I, um, I ran away from that. And, and, and fairly soon after that, um, I started dating a great girl. I became a starter on my team. I started oh, to go to cool parties. Uh, I moved out of you know uh, a family's house who was very good to me, a beautiful family. But I moved into my own place. Um, life changed. I signed a new contract, moved to a new city. There's there's a lot of stories and um, that go along with with those really four years. Uh, four years after that. Um, Could I ask one thing? Sure. So in that moment, the, these exceedingly rare moments where we're in deep prayer, vulnerable prayer to the Father in these thoughts that rob our yeah. you know our concentration that seem to come from 
anywhere but deep within us that aren't bubbling up of our subconscious, you know? If, if I've been contemplating being a priest and I heard, be a priest, yeah. you know, I'd be like, eh, that makes sense. Right. But when they sometimes come from out of nowhere and they're undeniably like, oh, like freakish, it's, it's almost right. scary. It's like, where did that come from? And why is it saying that? What was that moment? You said it, it was, it scared you, it was terrifying. Yeah. What other emotions did you feel? In well, that looking, moment? looking back, I say that, you know, uh, yeah, it, it was, you know, but, um, you know, yeah, certainly when we hear, when we hear something and I think a lot of us as Christians, when we're at prayer, we struggle with saying, is that, is that my own voice or is that God's voice? Mm-hmm. Oh, like, yeah. is that my desire? Or is that his desire? Like, how do I discern this? Well, how do I know that I'm making the right decision for this particular aspect of my family's life or this decision that I have to make on a job or this decision, you know, to, to start a new podcast? Like, should, like, should I do this? Is this real? Like, is this from God or is it from me? You know, that's a really hard distinction to make, but it comes in relationship with Jesus. Like I've learned along the way, that there's many voices in our life. Right? There's the voice of, of ourselves, there's the voice of God, there's the voice of the world, there's the voice of the devil, right? Mm-hmm. Namely, those, those four voices in our life. And, and that's what discernment is called. Discernment is a word that in the Latin means to sift through. What are we sifting through? We're sifting through the voices that constantly fill our minds, and we're sifting through those voices so as to hear most clearly the voice of God. Right? So I don't want anybody who's watching this podcast or anybody who ever hears me to believe that because I heard... Um, what I perceive to be God's voice that day is the is the very reason why I became a priest or the mm. very reason why I left soccer behind to join the seminary. Um, that was the start of it. But good discernment is done over time, not because you saw an apparition. Not be, I, I always said, you know, have have send down an angel, have, have Blessed Virgin Mary appear to me and then I'll know. Right? Yeah, like, of course. Like, yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't happen that way because <laughs> God wants to be things. in relationship with us. He doesn't wanna, you know, everybody wants a sign. What does he say? He says, stop looking for signs. Stop asking for signs. What does he want? He wants a relationship with us. He wants us to speak with him. He wants us to live with him, right? And the good and the bad, and and, and to decipher and, and to, to discern, to sift through the voices of life so that we can hear his voice most clearly. And so that's why it took me, right? Not at that moment did I drop everything and and go follow him. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe that was my vice, but I was nowhere near the maturity that I needed to be in order to do that at that time. And it took me now almost four years later um, to actually make that decision because it was confirmed over and over and over again. I continued to hear his voice years at a time. That's when I knew it was him and not just me. Mm -hmm. That's that, that confirmed it at least. It was the affirmation of that voice. And that's good discernment. That's good relationship with God. That's why he doesn't want to be your genie in the bottle that every time you ask him something, he pops out and gives you what you want. He's not a genie in the bottle. He's a father. And fathers speak to their children, right? But we have to ask, we have to be good children, just like an angsty high schooler who doesn't want to speak to their parents. No, like sit down in relationship. If you want a relationship with God, sit down and speak with him. And it takes time. Relationships take time. Right, so um, that's what it took for me. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a disciple of Jesus, first of all, before I becoming a priest, I'm a disciple of Jesus first. Why? Because, because of that relationship. That's why I was able to answer whatever he wants. And that's why I'm able to say, Lord, thy will be done in the Our Father today and actually believe it. Mm-hmm. It's because of that relationship. It's not because he's genie in the bottle and like he pops out and tells me to do things, right? So um, that relationship changed everything. We are brought to you by Forest Edge Tree Service. If you have trees or tree stumps on your property that you want gone, go nowhere else but Livingston County's premier tree service provider, Forest Edge Tree Service. Your yard is no place for looming, dead, or damaged trees because it's just a matter of time before they come down, ruining your property, ruining your week, and ruining your bank account. This is exactly why you need to be a responsible adult and hire the services of Forest Edge Tree Service. Simply give Joe Rudin a call at 815-615-3037 or give them a text to get a free quote today. Keep your family, pets, vehicles, and neighbors safe and save yourself from a world of headaches when you call or text Forest Edge Tree Service and get those dangerous, looming, troublesome trees off of your property. That's Forest Edge Tree Service, Livingston County's premier tree service provider. You said that he kept kind of working on you, and this, what you had heard in your prayer, Be My Priest, kept kind of staying in your mind, kept nagging. Was it almost annoying at any part, at any point in your life? Did you try to shut it up? Be like, no, I'm not being a priest. And and then I have another follow-up question. Certainly, certainly, um, 
there, there was a time that it was nagging in, in the sense, and, and I, it's hard to say nagging. Um, it was just present and I didn't want it to be present. Mm -hmm. Right. It was, it was constantly present after that day for the next couple of years. It was, I could say it was present every day and, and increasingly, increasingly mm -hmm. on my mind. I remember one day specifically one day in training with my, with my team, I moved cities and I was in training one day and I was very close to making the decision. I was very close to, to like, to, to just leaving it all behind and saying, I need to go to seminary. Of course, I didn't want anybody to know that, but I remember in training thinking like being distracted in training, like not even listening to coach because it was like, I was just like, it was just running through my mind, everything. I was, I was actually wondering if they knew what I was thinking about. I was, I was starting to get paranoid that people knew what I never told them. Like it was that present to me. Um, so if, I don't know, I don't want to call that nagging. Um, God doesn't nag, but certainly there was a, there was a presence, a presence of mind um, that, that the Lord was, was at work in my life. But certainly I thought, you know, if I can just convict myself to fall in love with this girl, I can, I can be happily married after and God will forget about this call. How you know? interesting. <laughs> wow. It, it turns you out articulate he doesn't forget. The, the thinking in that moment very well, I feel like. I feel like a lot of guys have gone through similar things like that. Well, I've just reflected on it a lot. You know, um, I've wondered how God works. I constantly want to get better at, at hearing his voice. I constantly want to hear him. I constantly want to help others to find good solutions to hearing God's voice. It's, it's the best reason to do anything, right? And so, um, yeah, a lot of reflection on that and how it worked and how it worked for me. And, and you know, God, I, as I teach people too, like God desires to be consistent with us. He desires to be consistent. So if he's spoken to me that way in the past, he's going to speak to me that way in the future. It hmm. might be different for you. It might be different for me about how he speaks to us, but he desires consistency with us. And so um, I want to know the way that he's spoken to me in the past. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to look at that. I want to go back to it because likely he's going to speak to me like that again. Right. When did you officially make the decision then? Because you said Latin root of a word of of uh, decipher is to sift through. Mm -hmm. No, 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 discern. discern I'm sorry. Yeah. Decision is Latin for to cut off. So you know to <laughs> yeah, remove right. other options. That's awesome. What? When was that moment? So that you said um, everything else. To the side priesthood. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a moment. I don't. I don't know if this is the exact moment, but in my mind, this was the moment. Um, we, uh, I, I moved to a new team that, that was was slated to win the championship that year, and it just so happens we did. Right, the greatest, probably the greatest moment of my my professional soccer career. Right, um, was was um, winning this promotion in this tournament. Um, being able to um, spend an entire season um, really living success and and being an integral part of that team, being a starter on that team, um, playing the most minutes on that team. And I remember at the end of that season, um, I'd never seen a party. I was asking for parties, I got them, right? At the end mm -hmm. of that season, when you win and and the entire city gets involved, like it, it, there were parades, um, there were buses downtown, um, there were people in the square. In fact, the entire city, like the, the mayor gave everybody a day off of works just so that they could Holy party. Holy crap. Like, like it changes things. <laughs> like watch some videos of, of other Jeez. cities when they win, you'll, you'll see like uh, actually what happens there. It was an amazing thing. And then for the entire week, I was invited to to anybody who says they were anybody invited us to anything they wanted and and we basically did it, you know? And it was it was a ton of fun. I remember at the end of that week being like exhausted being exhausted from from the week of, of really like hanging out, partying and being celebrated and all that kind of stuff. I remember, you know, sitting in my bed at night, you know, exhausted but unable to sleep. And um, I remember thinking, this is it. Like, thank you, Lord. Like really, like I would prayed for this. I would prayed for it, like a time where I was really comfortable in life. Like where, where I had everything, you know, that, that time in the chapel, I was praying for comfort. All right, I got a girlfriend. I've got, uh, I'm a starter on my team. I got great parties. We just won a championship. Like, like I, I may never win a championship ever again in my life, right? Like, like, he, like I was saying, this is it. And then again, in a moment of grace, because God is consistent the way he speaks to us. In a moment of grace, I was saying, this is it. Like from the confidence of saying, this is it. This is all I want in life to saying, wait a second. I'm 25 years old, like, this is it? Like, what else is there? And, and I realized at that time, like, there, there was something wildly missing in my heart. Like, this wasn't it for me. Like, I was not satisfied with life. I wanted more. I wanted more. And it was at that moment that I realized that for the past three years, if I've been hearing, like, what God wants from me, maybe my dreams will never fulfill me. Like, I'm living my dream right now. It's unfulfilling. It's mm. awesome. It's fun. It's ultimately in my heart. It's unfulfilling for my life. And I realized at that moment, like, because I'm asking this question, like, what am I made for? I'm not made for soccer. 
I'm not made to be a professional athlete. It was the first time I was able to admit that to myself. Like, I'm not made for this. This is not why God created me. And if I do believe what I profess to believe, which is that God exists and God has a plan for my life, and because he's the God who speaks, I can know that plan for my life. If I never live that out, if I never respond to him, then will I ever become the man that I'm called to be? And will I ever be satisfied with life? Mm -hmm. The answer to that was no. It was that night, I believe, it was that night that I said, all right, Lord, this is it. Like, I'm ready. Like, I'm gonna, I'm ready to surrender to you. I'm ready to surrender to our relationship. I'm ready to do what you desire instead of just what I desire. Wow. Yeah. Man, it sounds like, wow. It, it seems like a surrender of sorts, but not really because it's a you surrender of ego. It really, right? And, and like I said before, it's 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 a surrender of ego. Like, who is in charge of my life? Right. I thought for all of my life, I'm in charge of my life. I make my own decisions. I get to become the man that I want to be. And I've realized, no. We get back to the manhood talk. It's not about me. This life is not about me. This is why it's not my story. It's not my story. This is God's story. This is the story that he wrote. He is the creator of his creation. I am his creature. Like, what does he want from me? Why did he create me? He created me for a specific purpose with a particular plan to, to, to really complete his kingdom and calling people back to himself. Mm -hmm. That's what everybody's <laughs> life is about, right? So how am I, how am I living out that mission? And, and now I didn't, I didn't know what I know today um, at that moment, but I realized my life was not my own, as Fulton Sheen says, right? The Archbishop Fulton Sheen, like your life is not your own. It's not, and and I I'm I'm very clear about that today. My life is not my own. That's why I can say, Lord, I surrender. Like, what is your will for my life? What it, what do you want? Like, I'm I'm willing to I'm willing to do it. You know what's crazy about that though is once you surrender and you're I'm willing to do whatever you want, Lord. Your life often tends to get better as as far as how how much purpose you feel and sure. how much you might not have as much fun like you used to. St. Augustine says it beautifully. Our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O oh Lord. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. gold, man. Like I've had times where I've partied with friends and gone out and drank and been lifting and and girls <laughs> are paying attention to me. That's peanuts compared to when right. I feel like I'm in the right spot spiritually with God. It's very weird because it doesn't make sense by our worldly estimates and our worldly calculations. Like that shouldn't be more fun and enjoyable. But it is. It, right. I think if we can recognize in our maturity, right, as 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 men is, um, and men and women, like, right, like we recognize in our maturity that that what true satisfaction is, is peace in my heart, right? It's not mm -hmm. just about having mm -hmm. fun. For all my life, I've had fun, right? It's all been fun, but it never brought me peace. Like, you talk about all those things. I think that there's a lack of peace. There's a lack of sustained happiness, which we call joy, right? Joy is a sustained happiness. That's why heaven is a, is, 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 is joyful Heaven is the place of a pure joy, right? Because it's, mm -hmm. it's a sustained happiness that doesn't end, right? That's why you're, you're, you're completely at peace in heaven. We, wanna, we want to, to be at peace on earth. In the midst of sufferings, I can, I can experience joy. You mm -hmm. know, people, and you say life gets better when you become a Christian. I, wanna, I just wanna like maybe put an asterisk by that. Why? Because Jesus says, when you become a Christian, you will deny yourself, take up your cross, and you will follow me, mm -hmm. which is not which doesn't necessarily bring happiness. It's not like the greatest thing. In fact, becoming a Christian may make us suffer, especially if you live in the United States of America today. Oh yeah. <laughs> like being a, being a bold Christian is not, you're probably gonna suffer and we're going to suffer. But can you and I, as our witness, can we remain joyful in the midst of suffering? Can saints who are burned at the stake be singing to God as they're, as they're fading off into heaven, right? Like, can, can you do, like, how is that possible? Because, being a Christian and following God is, is ultimately the, the result that it has is joyful. It's not necessarily pleasurable, which the yes. world seeks pleasure. Differentiating the, between right? these terms is incredibly important, I think. You're yeah. absolutely right. Yes, uh, pleasure, I mean, a lot of people chase what they think is happiness and it's just pleasure. It's like, okay, now that I have all these pleasures, you know, the women, the uh, the 
delicious food even the i can go out and eat and i can drink and do what it's i please all material stuff right? it's material things it's our house our car it's all the simple enjoyments you know? right and and i mean it's like this is kind of philosophical psychological i don't know uh it's either freud or it's jung that theorized that if you gave a bunch of people every single pleasure and they were all their needs were completely met and they were just living in luxury pure luxury pure pleasure for like a week after a week they'd kind of start to go mad and they'd start to just break things so that they could, you know, feel purpose in cleaning them up. Mm. Like we want to take on responsibility in a way. And I think that's a, a crucial part of happiness. You want this responsibility. You want the sense of purpose. You kind of want the challenge. Right. And, and, and this is where people think that, that, that Catholics are crazy, right? Because we do mm. penance. Right. One of the reasons that we do penance, which is basically like voluntary suffering. Like I, I deny myself a meal or, um, you know, whatever you can, mm -hmm. there, there, I cut myself off from the internet. Like I don't use my, I don't use a, a an iPhone. I use a, you know, whatever. So mm -hmm. why, why do we do that? Do we think that we're gaining heaven? Everybody says, oh, you just want to win heaven. You think that you can earn your way to heaven. You think you can work your way to heaven. No, we don't believe that either. Not at all. But by denying ourselves things, by denying ourselves pleasure, we have a greater thirst and a desire for that joy that is within us. We, we're actually, we're actually seeking a greater meaning in life and saying that, no, I don't live for pleasure. I'm denying the pleasure of life at times, not always, but I'm denying that pleasure of life so that I can have a greater desire for what God desires from me, that I don't mind taking up my cross. Mm. Because that inner that inner peace, that, uh, inner joy, even at the expense of the cross, right? The greatest, the greatest sign of love that the world has ever seen before is the cross that's behind your head right there. Right? It is, it, it is the... the laying down of one's life. Do you think that was pleasurable for Jesus Christ? No, but is it the greatest form of love that the world has ever seen? Yes, right? So um, the meaning of our life, the meaning of Jesus's life um, is not about pleasure, right? It's about becoming who we're made to be and, and who you and I are made to be, who we're made to be is, is those who give our lives for the sake of another, whether that's those who are neighbors, but ultimately for God. Like I wanna give my life to him. Yeah. And now and now that's what brings peace because that's what I was made for. My heart was made for that. My my whole life was made to 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 lay lay it down for another. Right. And that's kind of the definition of love, isn't it? To will the good of so from person to person willing the good of the other even at a sacrifice to yourself. Jesus loved the world and he was willing to sacrifice everything about him for our immense good, infinite right. good. So, yeah, that just paints that picture very clearly. You were 25, if I understand correctly, when you officially began testing for in your enrollment in um, the, what's it called? Seminary. Oh, I guess. Okay. Seminary. Yeah. So you were 25 and I just want to touch on this and I apologize if it's weird. Yeah. It might be, I don't mean for it to be, but you were 25, you were at the height of your soccer career, maybe starting to go down on the other side of it. You were a very good soccer player. You had a lot of success. You had a lot of what I would imagine would be fame in Chile. And then you came to the United States. You had the girlfriend that you were speaking about. At this time, you were anyone who does their research and looks back on Father Hilgenbrink when he was playing, you were a stud. Like <laughs> you look like the guy that played soccer in the movies. You had to have a lot of female attention. And one of the most unattractive things about the priesthood to young men is the vow of celibacy right you you are a spiritual father you do not get married you do not have a family you know you, you don't have those relations with women was that a big scare for you when you really started to for sure well, when you entered the priesthood i guess yeah well it starts when you enter seminary right like <laughs> right, you don't start right. you don't start living it as a priest you start living it um um as a seminarian, but at the same time, um, well, let me answer your question first and then we'll get back. The answer to your question, of course, it's, it's, it's terrifying. Because why? Because we were made for this. Again, a misconception about the Catholic Church or Christians in general, that, that somehow we, we, have, we detest sex or we hate sex or, you know, um, no, like are we rigid about rules about sex? No, the, the reality is, is that we were made for sex, right? Like mm -hmm. our- Biologically, this, Biologically, our like, like, yeah, look at yourself in the mirror and know that you are, you are insignificant insignificant unto yourself, right? Like we were made for the other. And again, we we're made to lay down our life for the other, but uh, the highest expression of human love is our sexuality. Right? That's the highest expression of human love. John Paul II said that. Um, and so it's natural. It's natural that desire. In fact, not to have that desire is unnatural, 
right? Mm-hmm. So of course that was present. And I was wondering at that time, maybe my greatest fear was, um, you know, seeing all the the mess ups in the priesthood and, and seeing um, guys that, that who had failed and who had given a terrible witness and then look at myself and be like, am I gonna fail? Like, am, am I capable? Like, are, are we, we made for this is like, is this okay? You know, is that, is that possible? And um, certainly it took a lot of understanding and a, and a lot of training and, and all that kind of stuff to, to fully understand what celibacy is, what it's all about and how, how it is actually good um, and, and a higher good to live perhaps even than marriage, right? And so, um, yeah, that was a scare. That was, that, was, that was difficulty. At the same time, at the same time, I challenge you and I challenge uh, any of our young people because I often tell high schoolers and college students like, um, do you know what you're called to right now? You're not married, right? You're called to celibacy, right? Like, why is that so scary hey, right now? You, like, you raise a great point why, there. Why, why do we make this huge thing about um, about priests or anybody else who, who desires or who decides to be celibate, when at the same time, if we're Christians, at least, we believe that we are called to that whenever we're single, right? It's there's no difference. Right, in a sense, right. so if we're living that well, which you know, there's a lot of struggle with that, no doubt, um, and 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 a lot of weakness because we're, we're naturally wired for for sex, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, certainly, there's there's a difficulty there, but um, yeah, and and fear, but at the same time, I can tell you right now, I'm a, I'm a joyful celibate man. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. It's it's an amazing life, uh, and there's God's grace is is sufficient. I'll say that it's sufficient. It's and um, and you know we don't have to be we don't have to be uh, nasty or rigid or, or crotchety or whatever words you want to say. Um, I'm I'm joyful, and it's because I get to give more now. <laughs> I get to give so much and, and sacrifice for the Lord, and that is it is a true sacrifice. But I get to give of myself and to be like you say a spiritual father. Um, and to bring out that 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 fruitfulness, like there's a lot of fruit that comes from laying down our lives for our Lord, and and um, I, I receive graces all the time, and the people around me uh, receive the the grace of 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 having a spiritual father. You you said a lot of great things there, brilliantly put. By the way, I just got to say that. First of all, you would agree, correct? That it, our sexual desires, even when we aren't married, the desire itself that is innately within all of us, that's nothing to be ashamed of, right? We all have it and it's healthy, it's good. Right. It, it's a necessary component to drive the continuation of the human race. There's a reason it's in you and God put it in you. Agreed? Absolutely. Right? No, it is It is. It is the, one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given us and, and we're hardwired for it. Like every single person is. We were made for marriage. I, I, I tell um, college students a lot, like, dude, we're all made for marriage. What we're, we're considering is if we're called beyond it. Mm-hmm. Right? Am I called to something beyond that? A supernatural living upon earth. Really, celibacy is living how they live in heaven. I hate to crush any of our listeners here, but um, <laughs> but there's no sex in heaven, right? Like, right. We're, like we're not married in heaven. Jesus makes that perfectly clear that we're not married in heaven. So mm-hmm. the attempt to live celibacy here is the attempt to live heaven on, on earth to give witness, right? When when people see me in these like crazy clothes, right? They're called clerics, um, and and no, they're like, is that a pre? You know, and he lives a celibate life. What, what like what is it supposed to call to mind? It's supposed to call to mind that I have no other interest on earth. Right? It's supposed to say that I'm living for heaven. Like this is this is what it's about. You know, mm-hmm. you, the the really the the reason one of the reasons, not the reason, one of the reasons for celibacy is to give witness that we're not there yet. Like I'm living for heaven. This is not my home. I'm on pilgrimage. I came here and I'm going back. The Lord sent me here Beautiful. and this is not home. Right? And I want to live with that conviction. My celibacy reminds me of that every day. I'm not home. I am striving for God's kingdom. And, and this is just a purification of who I am and what I'm meant to be about to live for heaven forever. People think, oh, do you, do you not like girls? Or do you, do, you, do you not like sex? No, like that was required in order for me to give that to the Lord to live for his kingdom, right? No, I'm... Yeah, I, I remain a man just like everybody else. Right. I remember Father Mike Schmitz, uh, who plenty of my Protestant friends even know, he said something hilarious that was hilariously true at one of his summits. He said, hey guys, I have a confession to make. I'm attracted to women. It's like, yeah, right. well, duh, I guess so. Like some people, are you not attracted to women? Of course right. you are. And it is out of love that you decline that pleasure, I guess, 
and direct it towards God. And one thing that you touched on that I want to talk about too is you talk to these high school kids that are not married. And they say, how could you be celibate, Father? It's like, look, guy, you're supposed to be celibate too. That's right. If you're not married, you're not supposed to be And I think it's really uncomfortable when I make that comment back. Like, aren't you uh, aren't celibate? You? <laughs> <laughs> Silence. <laughs> that's hilarious. No, yeah, that's that's extremely true also. And you know what? There's a great chance for me to say something that I've, tried to say plenty of times to people before whenever this conversation comes up for you as a priest to commit sexual sin or to have some sexual engagement with a woman or whatever to have any sexual engagement would be equally as sinful and you just correct me if i'm wrong equally as sinful as me who am not married who is not married to have a sexual engagement with even my girlfriend right like and, and then also for homosexuals to have a sexual relation these are all disordered acts of sexuality am i correct for for non-wedded man and woman and for people who take a vow of celibacy i think i think what you're trying to say is that there's a beautiful teaching of our church on sexuality which is that there's an order to sexuality right. we talked about the order of things and um the beauty of it is, is that there's no double standard there's no mm-hmm. double standard for for heterosexuals, homosexuals, singles, married. That's we're, the beauty. We're, we're right. all called to live out our sexuality in an ordered fashion, right? And so, what is that? And 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 how do I live that out? That is the question. And that's how that's how we're supposed to to, to mind how we're supposed to live, right? It's not a judgment upon anybody. And I, I'm not judging high schoolers. I'm not judging right. Uh, no judgment. No like, judgment. Right. 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 In, in a sense, I, we can judge acts, but we're not judging the person. Um, we're just we're just saying that. There's, there's a way that God created us. And by that way, we're, we're meant to know how to use our bodies and to use our sexuality in the ordered way that he created us. And, and, and namely, that's for babies and bonding, as we say. Like, it's, it's made for love and it's made for, for procreation to bring forth new life, basically new disciples for God, those who are gonna advance the kingdom, all of those things for a greater amount of love right? And, and I know that that definition of love is, is obscured, but you said it, Thomas Aquinas, uh, to will the good of another, right? Um, and so there, the beauty is that, yeah, there's no double standard. Right. There's, there's, there's one standard for, for, for sexual love. Mm-hmm. God bless the catechism of the Catholic Church that seems to articulate so yeah. beautifully the logical beliefs that we hold. I, that's one of my favorite things about Catholicism is that we explain everything, yeah, some people say blind it's faith, awesome. you know, oh, you guys, you guys just believe things, you know, that's, no, I don't, everything we believe is logical, right? Right. Um, there is certainly mystery because there's things that are beyond sure. the human mind, right? We, we humbly acknowledge that there's something more than, than what I know. We call that mystery, but mystery doesn't mean that it's not true, right? Mm-hmm. There's truth in mystery. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's, there certainly are explanations to the things that we believe. Um, I don't live blind faith. I, I think through things logically, um, and I, and I concede, um, where my, where my mind can't go further. Right. Father Hilgenbrink, this has been fantastic so far. We're getting towards the end of this thing. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Sorry, I'm going to take a little more of it here, but so you, you enroll in mounts in Mount St. Mary, is that right? Mount St. Mary Seminary. Seminary? Yes, okay. Emmitsburg, Maryland. Explain to us really quick, what exactly does the education process for an aspiring priest look like? Is it just like getting your bachelor's degree? Is it a little more? What's it look like? So there's a couple of different tracks, and the, the really the question is, do you have your college degree yet or not? Hmm. Um, and there's those tracks are different based on that, because in order to, to enter major seminary, you already have to have a college degree, right? So really, seminary is, is a master's degree or two right? Depending on, on how far you get in your education. Right now, um, the church believes that the, the magic number for, for seminary is six years, right? And so having a college degree, which was required for me to even enter, um, and it could be any college degree, but then entering upon that, then I spend two years in, in philosophy. Um, and you can get a degree or not, you just have to do two years of philosophy doing those required courses. Um, and then after that, a four-year theology degree, um, and there's, there's, yes, different tracks that you can take within theology based on, you know, your desires, your interests and all that kind of stuff. But a four year theology degree, um, I ended up getting a couple master's degrees, you know, in those, those subjects, which is really cool. I never thought that I would go back to school. I'm not an intellectual. And so <laughs> I just say that I have two master's degrees is not a brag. It's, it's, a, I'm actually a little bit, um, humbled by, you know, the Lord taking me back to school where I never wanted to go again, um, and giving me the grace to be able to get through it. But, um, but so that magic number is six years and it's not because of the intellectual work that we do there, 
right? There's, you can study theology for the rest of your life. Like I said, there's, there's so much mystery. There's so much beauty in theology. Mm -hmm. we, should, we should be ongoing learners for the rest of our life. That's, that's digging into the life of God and to our meaning behind, within that. But most of that is, it takes a while. Like, if you're in a relationship and going to get married, like it should take a while for you to date and to know one another and to know one another intimately and deeply and, and, and to know that that relationship is built on a strong foundation. In the same way, in seminary, it's almost, it mirrors a dating relationship. I'm, 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 mm -hmm. I'm spending so much time with the Lord and it's a formation process. Like living as a celibate in this world and becoming a priest and, and, and all the obligations and, 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 and really work, if you wanna say, that, that a priest does, it takes time to learn a, a way of life, of living with the other of how that actually works out. And, and certainly we know today that like, like that takes a lot of training. Mm -hmm. And so um, six years is kind of that, that sweet spot where to be longer than that is, is um, you know, we could say we could study or, or be in formation for the rest of our lives. Um, but really that, that six year kind of sweet spot is, is where both intellectually, pastorally, spiritually, and humanly, which are the four pillars of formation, um, where where we've grown into that man, where we are saying we're ready to to now be reinserted into the real world, mm -hmm. and and to embrace or as you could say attack uh, the world uh, with the kingdom of heaven. So really, it's six years is the magic number, but that's after four years of college, assuming you had a degree. Yep. If you come straight out of high school and you say seminary is for me, right? Then how long will it take? Will you have to? St will it still be ten years total, or it would be eight years? Eight years, okay. Eight years, um, and and a lot of that. That that's where it gets to be a little bit negotiable. But you do that. I say eight years because you go through four years of college degree, but in that you're studying philosophy, so you get your philosophy studies out of the way. So after mm. four years of getting your degree, then you jump into just four years of theology. I see. And so it it combines pretty nicely, and and it's it's. We have two guys actually this year from from the Diocese of Peoria who we just sent off to school um, who are on that track. They just get jumped out of high school and they're going straight into college seminary. We have two other guys from the diocese who already have a college degree and they just jumped into to major seminary and they're on the six year track. Right. One of my good friends, Francis Strong, went straight yes. from high school into seminary. So it's it's yeah. fun watching that journey and it's a long journey. And he just graduated college in May. So he's mm -hmm. just jumping into to major seminary. What a great dude and a great family. And uh, yeah, Francis is on is on a great track, man. Yeah. Okay, so you know him. <laughs> he's one of my seminarians. I have to know him. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize. Yeah, of course he is. Yeah. Okay. So just to wrap up that part right there, while you were in seminary, you also did some volunteer work. That's, I mean, you're, not only are you doing very, what I would call gruesome school work for seminary, but you're also volunteering time to do prison ministry and work for an immigration lawyer. Is that correct? I did. Man, yeah. you did your homework. I didn't know That's you right, could find dude. that stuff. Hey, um, well, we call that, so as I mentioned, there's four pillars of, of formation, human, spiritual, intellectual, and pastoral. So in our pastoral formation, we're sent out, yeah, you could say volunteers, but really, uh, I, didn't, I was voluntold to go, to go <laughs> okay. do some things. And throughout those four years, there's various different experiences. So you can work in healthcare ministry the first year, you can work in, um, in education, um, you can work in emergency ministries. You can, there, there's all kinds of different things. One of those assignments, my favorite assignment, um, was, was working in the prison. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. um, for many reasons, but um, those those dudes know what life is about because they sit in silence and they sit in a place where they don't wanna be. And all of a sudden they tell the truth of their life for the first time, right? Those who come to chapel in a prison are men who want something more out of life. And I've never seen a fire and a desire out of men like those men who know that they've messed up mm. and they want something different. Right, and it's so cool to see. I got to teach basically RCIA in, in, in prison, and got to tell the truth to guys. Nothing watered down. You just you just you just speak, and 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 uh, there's great conversation. Everybody's listening, and and uh, you go back and forth. Some of the some of the funniest experiences, and and uh, good experience, scary experience, whatever. You, there's so many different emotions, and but yeah. So there's there's that pastoral side of things where you, you get to work with different people, and and um, certainly yeah, I worked for an immigration lawyer in D.C. Um, helping. Um, mainly Hispanics um, to to figure out paperwork and and um, and to become naturalized in the country. Mm. So um, yeah, just different experiences, man. It's it, it's uh, it's crazy things that um, I never thought I'd, thought I'd have the opportunity to do, and now it kind of opens up your mind to to what's possible and where the Lord desires to be in every place uh, of our culture. 
Man, well-rounded, to say the least. You have a lot of experiences under your belt, especially, and I don't mean this in any negative way, especially for a priest. You have traveled the world, you have played soccer at the highest level, you were, you've done a lot of things that, are, that you don't too commonly see for those entering the priesthood. A lot of the times they were, you know, they grew up very devout, and then they entered the seminary naturally, you know? Right, that's, that's our typical, that's our typical, like, um, experience of like what we think about when we see a priest, like, oh, this guy was born that way, you know, he was, mm-hmm. he was born into the priesthood, you know, um, that's, that's not the truth of anybody, I know, honestly, mm-hmm. um, tons of my, if I could tell stories of, of the guys that I studied with, they come from all walks of life, um, all kinds of, of different backgrounds, you know, from, from doctors to lawyers to, uh, to military men, when probably our biggest group of guys in seminary are military men. And there's many reasons for that, but they live a similar lifestyle, like seeking order, seeking Mm -hmm. uh, to change the world, seeking to be on mission, you know, like it's, it's pretty awesome to see, uh, who the Lord calls. Are they like intense with their ministry and stuff? Like, you know, that, that's based on personality, but but certainly there are all those guys that are kind of militaristic about about the way that they live their lives, you know, after after their experience of military. But certainly after those six years of, of formation, everybody's pretty well-rounded, you know. It, formation works. Formation works. So, Father, your your story is one of courage, of, of doing the right thing, even though it doesn't seem that cool, of, of masculinity in the purest sense of the word. It, it's one of worrying about, seeing to your salvation of souls, yours included, instead of salvation of status. And I just think that's incredible. And I just want to know, this might be a loaded question. How can people like me and the listeners work to, or what can we remember to build the characteristics necessary to do kind of what you did, not necessarily enter the priesthood, although perhaps, but to live purposeful lives, to to feed our faith and to get our head on straight and, and aimed towards God. Am I making sense? Is yep. this okay? Yep. No, just just life advice, right? Yeah. Um, well, I would say that one of the first things, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of like leadership. I love leadership podcasts. I love to grow as a leader. I love to know, you know, different solutions. But one of those things is, right, you always have to know your goal. I would sit down right today and say, what is my goal in life? Like, if you don't know what that is, like d- mine is, I want to be in the kingdom. I want to. I want to be a saint in heaven. Like that. That's what I want to do. Like that is my desire to be ready for heaven at all times. Am Am I living that kind of life? Right. If that's not my goal, then then by definition it is something else. Right. It, that's what it is now. And I years ago I defined that that was that was not my goal, and I wanted it to be right. Like there's something mm-hmm. else I wanted to live for. So ask yourself, what are you living for? Ask yourself that question that I asked, especially if you're in a, a good headspace. Like, why am I here? What's the meaning of life? Am I living for that? And if I'm not, then what excuses am I making for not living for that? Because that's what I did for several years too when I was feeling called to the priesthood. There's many reasons why I would not live that way or wouldn't want it. But ask yourself, what is my goal? What is, what is your north? Where, where are you going? Mm-hmm. What is the goal of life? Do you know where you're going, right? So that's one thing. And then there could be several things, but I would just say, then what is the next step that you need to take to be on that path? Sometimes we make this like elaborate plan about our life. We have a 10 point plan about what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give up this, that. I'm gonna do all these crazy things. And the next day you're like, I can't ever live that way. I'll never, I'll never be able to do this. I'll never, if this is what it takes, I'll never be able to do it. And you're overwhelmed because you have bad habits in your life and you're never gonna be able to live that way. No, you don't have to erase the, uh, the, the goal just because you, you're trying to change 20 things at once. What's one thing that you can do tomorrow? All right, make your goal today. What's the next step? What is the, just ask yourself, what's the next step? What is something small that you could do that you would do that would make things a lot better? What's your next decision? What's your next step about, about being the, the man or woman that you're called to be? What is it? All right, and take that step and it should be a step towards your goals. Imagine if you did that every day for the next year. What kind of person would you be? Oh my gosh. You'd be changed. Gosh. You'd be changed. If you spent 15 minutes in prayer a day for the next year, how would that change your life? Like, could you do 15 minutes? I tell the people, that's the 1% challenge. Do you know what 1% is? 1% is about 14 minutes and some odd seconds of your day, basically 15 minutes. Would you be able to give God 1% of your day? That's the 1% challenge. Can you give him 15 minutes? Okay, if I could do that every day for the next year, what kind of man would I be? I'd be changed. If I'm not doing that, I'd, I'd be different, right? Um, 
if I just wanted to start getting back to church, you know, on Sunday, could I just make that, that's just gonna be my one goal. Like I'm gonna start going to mass on Sunday. Um, could that be my goal? That's just, if I'm not doing that, that's, that, that should be the next thing, right? If I ask God for forgiveness, if I confess my sins, if I, am I trying to be different? Am I, am I looking at myself and critiquing myself? What business, what, what, what sports team, what person seeking excellence doesn't critique themselves? Who doesn't critique their own podcast to say, mm. these microphones gotta be better? You know? You're talking, I just switched them yeah, for this episode. Right? Yeah, these these cameras gotta be better. If I want a better podcast, like what am I doing to critique myself? Am I getting coffee mugs with rubber bottoms so it doesn't clank on the table? Like what is, <laughs> what's going on? How am I getting, dude, you're critiquing yourself all the time so that you can get right. better for this podcast. What if we did that with our lives? And we think, oh, this is like some kind of Catholic guilt. You know, I can't look at myself that way because oh. I don't want to guilt myself into things. No, you're afraid of getting better. You're afraid of, of being someone that, that, that you're not and you need to be and you want to be. Come on, man. Like, take a step. What's the next step of being the person that you're called to be? Dude, put rubber on the bottom of your coffee mugs. <laughs> so good, man. Father Chase Hilgenbrink, <laughs> man. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Wow. Thank you for your time. That's all. (laughs) Good to be with you. Thanks so much for the invite. Thanks for the opportunity to witness to your people. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll be back again. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening to that episode of The Paul Garcia Show. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it on Facebook or with your friends. And if you haven't already, like this page on Facebook and subscribe on YouTube. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave this show a five-star rating and an honest review. If you'd like to support The Paul Garcia Show, you can do so by donating any dollar amount on Venmo to The Paul Garcia Show. Additionally, if you'd like to become a monthly donor and gain access to exclusive bonus footage, you can do so on patreon.com forward slash Paul Garcia. Until next Sunday, thanks for listening and watching. I'm Paul Garcia. God bless and have a great week.